Welcome to Network Engineering. This is chapter four, <laughs> part four, where we're gonna take a deep dive into subnets. I just wanna make a comment for you all. This is maybe the first time that you're seeing this video. Uh, for me, this is now the sixth time that I've done the lecture. Um, I've had, <laughs> I don't know how many, well, obviously five mess ups, but one, the video didn't save correctly, so it was corrupted. One, the microphone wasn't turned on, so I lectured for an hour without um, any audio. Another time, um, the PowerPoint displayed fine, but it recorded just a white screen. It's just been a thing. So anyway, hopefully this is the last time for me. Maybe I'm getting better each time I do it, or maybe I've crossed that valley and now I'm, I'm gonna start getting worse every time I do it. I'll let you all be the judge. All right, so with that out of the way, we're gonna do a deep dive into subnets. And the uh, rationale for subnets, we've, we've kind of talked about them before, but I'm gonna do them one more time. Um, when we have just one giant LAN segment, we're gonna have a lot of contention for that transmit line. So only one transmitter can be using it at a time, and so, that's gonna be a problem. So one reason for subnetting is to balance performance. I can allow multiple devices to be transmitting and receiving simultaneously as a result of using switches and, and splitting up LAN segments. Another problem we didn't really talk about is that the network is limited in distance. Depending on the technology, the speed of the network, the media, all of that kind of good stuff, typically just a few hundred feet. And once you get beyond that, what actually happens is the speed of light propagating down that wire actually takes longer um, to reach the, all of the remote sites. Then so it becomes hard for cards to detect that they are jabbering on one another. And so you just start garbling frames and data gets all messed up. Or the signal is so weak that it um, just isn't a proper form. So by using switches or by, by, by basically breaking up the, the network into little pieces, into subnets, um, we can essentially let each of those pieces be independent and then just keep putting runs in between those subnets and basically subnet A talks to B, B talks to C, and there they can all talk to each other. Um, and we've effectively tripled our distance. Um, another reason that we want to be able to use subnets is to um, isolate problems and reduce the odds of a catastrophic failure. So, um, it, you know, it doesn't happen very often. Um, when I was a, a young network admin, I worked for a uh, mafia-run construction company. Well, maybe they weren't really, but they, sort of, they sure seemed like it. Anyway, um, I got a call because there was smoke coming out of one of the vice president's computers. And when I went into his office, um, sure enough, the network card had caught fire. Um, and I did some, some troubleshooting. It really wasn't the network card's fault. Um, the electricians installed the wiring in parallel in the same wiring conduits with the fluorescent lights. And the fluorescent lights were actually able to induce a current onto the network lines and uh, that caused um, a voltage to appear and it just basically was blowing out the network connections. Oops, I didn't install those wires. Um, another problem that we can fix with subnetting is the problem of collision domains and broadcast storms. And um, <laughs> I can tell you a funny story about this too. So back in the early 90s, uh, when I was in uh, an undergraduate school, like you, um, Doom came out. Um, so I think if I date that correctly, it was the winter of 93, 94 timeframe. And uh, I was a lab attendant and we were able to set up Doom on some of the university computers and uh, after the lab closed, we had a great time playing LAN, a LAN version of Doom. Um, unbeknownst to us, uh, Doom at that time used the, well, okay, I knew it was Novell Netware 
requirement and I knew it used the NetWare protocols IPX and SPX. But what I didn't know at the time, <laughs> I found out the very next day, but I didn't know at the time that it was broadcasting. Um, and so every time that you pull the trigger or move around or whatever you're doing, the Doom game was broadcasting that on the network. And at the time, the computer science department was in the same building with the computer center, and they were all on the same segment. Now, at 2 o'clock in the morning, when the university is effectively shut down and we have keys to the lab, so we're in there playing Doom, no problem. But there was this guy named Brad, and Brad was a terrible person. I didn't like Brad. Brad didn't like me. It was pretty mutually, um, a lot of animus between us. And... Um, Brad was jealous that we could play Doom, and we didn't invite him. But he was a jerk, so, you know, not going to do that. Well, Brad comes in the lab uh, the next day uh, during business hours and starts playing Doom with his friends. And the <laughs> way that we know that that happened was because the uh, mainframe administrator was trying to get into the mainframe, and the mainframe was unresponsive. And that's bad. Like when the mainframe doesn't respond, you know, you're spending millions of dollars on this thing. It damn well better respond. So he was upset, um, went into the console room and the, it was fine. So he called the network administrator. The network administrator is like, well, this isn't right. I can't get into any of the machines either. And so very quick diagnostic work. They, they pinpointed the problem to the subnet was just maxed out like it was full-blown 100% load. Um, one of my friends was the grad assistant for the network administrator and he's like, hey, I wonder if it has anything to do with Doom. We were playing it last night. And uh, the network admin went flying up into the computer lab, found Brad and his friends playing Doom. And uh, they, uh, let's just say they got yelled at pretty, pretty good. Um, of course, they turn around and said, well, Briggs was playing it that last night. So then I get called <laughs> into the network administrator's office and I'm like, I didn't know. Um, anyway, broadcast storms, man, they happen. And when they do, they can really disrupt everything on that network. And so, um, you know, don't, don't be a Brad. Um, uh, it, just don't do that. Subnets also allow us to partition the network into multiple administrative rate, uh, domains. And we get a level of independence between those different domains. So the idea is that we can allow different administration to be done on different subnets. And so for very, very large networks, you may separate the administrative work onto multiple network administrators who are in charge of multiple subnets. You know, it's just a pretty easy thing to slice and dice and, and give people control over their region. And it may even possibly reduce costs. So if we were to think about, if I had to support one LAN segment with a thousand network cards on it, I'm going to really need some high-end technology to be able to handle that. But if I can divide and conquer, yeah, so there's a good term to use, divide and conquer then maybe I can use some less expensive hardware, just I had to have more copies of it. So, you know, maybe I can buy some commercial off the shelf, you know, mid range type of switches and, and instead of spending a million dollars, I only have to spend a few thousands of dollars. So when I say possibly reduce costs, what I'm about to say seems to, to kind of counteract that. Um, when we subnet, we also have to then connect those nets. And so, we're going to have to add additional hardware um, either at level two or level three and so there is going to be some overhead for doing that like subnetting isn't going to be free um, and it's not like some magic bullet it, i've got to have a router right i've got to be able to connect those subnets and that router is going to cost me some money but i think in the long run if you look at the cost of having everybody on the same subnet and having like everybody using 100 gigabit network lines so that we all get decent performance versus everybody just using regular network cards and gigabit lines and off-the-shelf switches probably in the long run subnets are going to be a cheaper solution so before we kind of jump into how do we subnet 
let's look at a couple different land technology or sorry land topologies and so what I have here is a way that we could use a bridge to create some subnets so what I have are two lands and maybe initially these would have been the same or maybe they were always separate but the idea is Land A is connected to this bridge device and it connects land B. Bridging often is happening down at layer two, the, our, our next layer down, we're not there yet. But it's not hard to imagine how uh, we could use a bridge to connect two different land segments. Um, whenever a packet is sent on this network, the bridge just sends it on to that network or vice versa, right? Um, and we can program the bridge maybe to do some filtering. So for instance, um, if we did an L2 bridge, we wouldn't necessarily have to pass those broadcast messages. Maybe we would. Maybe we would pass only certain broadcast messages. You know, whatever the rules are gonna be. One of the neat things about bridging is it allows us to effectively uh, change media. So for instance, what if LAN B here is actually a wireless network? And then this is the wired side. And so we can use a bridge to connect those two networks and join them together as if they were one. Um, another good example of bridging is uh, also using it as a media uh, translator. Um, I have a Comcast connection at home, so I have cable coming in from the outside. And it goes into my modem which is also a DOCSIS modem. And out of the box, the DOCSIS modem also tries to be a router. And I didn't want any of that functionality. And I, in fact, I bought my own DOCSIS just to get it out of the way. And the first thing I did when I unboxed it is I put it into bridge mode. And that basically meant that it's now transparent to my network. Like, I don't see the DOCSIS device anywhere in the network. All it's doing is taking an Ethernet packet from the LAN side here and turning it into a cable connection and shoving it out over the, I think it's PPOE, which is point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. And that's it, right? I don't, it doesn't do anything else. Um, and so it's effectively invisible. I then have my router and my router uh, is actually doing the routing and as far as my router is concerned, it's connected directly to Comcast. So this, this DOCSIS bridge um, completely hidden from my network. Um, and so bridging allows us to do some interesting tricks just like that. Another way that we can use uh, subnets and kind of create a topology is using switches. Switches again are going to operate at L2 and an L2 switch, of course, is going to be working at the Ethernet level, um, not the IP level, which is kind of the chapter we're in. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get there. But the idea is that I have the Ethernet switches are going to have um, a number of different hosts connected to them. And we're going to keep creating these little uh, clusters of computers that are connected to one switch. And then those switches are going to be bridged to each other. Now. In some switches, especially Cisco's Catalyst uh, switches, this functionality is merged right into the switch into what's called an uplink port. So that looks like a W. So the idea being that um, there could be a one gig ethernet connection here between each of these devices, and then this might be a 10 gig connection between those two switches, or switches in a router or, or whatever it's gonna be. So um, for, I think, the way I, even with my terrible artistic skills, um, I think it's clear that this is a star topology. In other words, um, it looks like it's kind of radiating out from these switches. And we can use these switches to kind of piggyback from one to the other and eventually um, extend the, the network distances, handle multiple loads, handle lots of computers. Switches don't have to work with just one computer per port. Um, in fact, that's probably, um, well, that, that works best, but that's not the only way to do it. And in fact, when we do this, this is called a micro segment. 
So in this arrangement, each computer occupies, has each computer has an interface, each interface is connected directly to a switch on one port. Um, if I have a 24 port switch, I get to have 24 computers and no more. Um, but that's not a requirement of the switch itself. That's just kind of how we implement these things. With micro segmenting, it minimizes the sharing of that one connection. Like there's nothing else between that switch and that PC. There's no, there's no contending for that line. Um, and so that's oftentimes the most efficient, but it also requires the most switch ports. Now, even Cisco has, has kind of broken the rules. Uh, we now have Cisco IP phones and in, in a lot of offices, what happens is you go into a phone and the phone has another jack and that jack connects your PC as well. And so to reduce the cost of adding new wires from the wiring closet into every office on campus, you can simply add the phone and pass the PC right through the phone, right? So the phone isn't trying to bridge or anything. It literally is just trying to share the wires. Um, and it, it has no problem doing that. Because this is an L2 switch, however, each switch port, the software on the switch needs to know what's plugged into it. So for example, when it sees some device address for device A, it needs to know, do I have device A plugged into any of these ports? And it makes sense in micro segmenting if like this is device A over here that the switch can say, yep, I got gotcha. you. But what if the, the device is actually up here? Like what if this PC is device A? Well, again, the, the only way that the switch can know to send the data along those lines is to keep a list of all the devices that are connected to each of the switch ports. All right, two doesn't seem bad, um, but there is some upper limit. And uh, once we hit that limit, then the switch is gonna really not be able to um, serve the role of extending the, the number of connections. I'm not sure what the limit is. Um, I'm, Cisco probably has it advertised somewhere. To be honest with you, I suspect we're getting pretty close to that limit. In 163, we have um, PCs. We have uh, oscilloscopes. Those oscilloscopes have network connections. We have power supplies that are programmable and you can connect the power supply to software and either um, drive the power supply's output voltages or monitor the power supply's output voltage. We also have multimeters. Those multimeters uh, are also uh, programmable as well as they connect over the internet. Um, and so there's four network connections right there. And then students in my classes often end up having to use a device under test. So it could be the Z board or something else and oftentimes we have two of those. So when you put all of that together, we're looking at uh, six network connections per seat um, at, the, at the table. And there's 10 seats, plus there's some other equipment in the room. So um, what Tim has had to do is install a bunch of switches um, in the room. And I think we have two 48 port switches hidden in the room somewhere and their uplink port is shared onto, because the uplink ports on the wiring closet are already filled, their uplink ports just go to a regular port on the switch. So the switch in the wiring closet needs to know about 60 some ethernet addresses that are plugged into uh, one port. So I know that the Cisco hardware can handle at least 60 computers plugged into one port because, well, we've done it. Um, the star topology uh, can extend distances and it can uh, allow us to pass data simultaneously. Star topology works amazing when we have distributed access loads. So for instance, if this group of PCs is all trying to access that server, um, then this bridge connection is not going to be used very often. If this group of PCs is trying to access its server, then by and large, these are all gonna be completely independent and in parallel. And so computers down on this group here 
are going to be able to use that switch without any interference from the computers up here. However, as we've already seen from the applications section, a lot of what we do now um, doesn't look like this. And so we'll talk about ways that we can, well, different ways that we can deal with it. But this is the star topology that you get using seg uh, segments over switches. And very similar to this, but with a little more intelligence is the segments using routers. So we mix and match here. So we can take a couple of star grouper groups and connect them to uplink ports to a router. And then the router becomes the, the segment manager, right? So then at this point, we're gonna be working at the IP layer. We're gonna be looking at L3. Now routers can work at L2, but that's usually the job of the switch. The router is going to have rules to determine when to forward data, when not to forward data, how to forward data, where to forward data. So whereas these switches are trying to make sure everybody sees all the broadcast messages and things like that, router is going to try to tamp all that down. So it's going to try to control the broadcast uh, that goes back and forth. Um, routers can also do some packet filtering so they can selectively pass messages between those domains. They could also block them. For instance, if this is some super secret domain or computer here, and this is uh, some rando user, and it tries to access it, the switch or the router can say, "Niet, don't you don't get that." So, um, routers have uh, some security that they can add to the network, and the um, one last really important thing that routers add is the ability to have different device maximum transmission units. And what that allows us to have is to separate these different um, uh, ethernet segments into completely different types of, of performing systems. So for example, if the router is trying to um, move from a cabled router connection to fiber optic, um, it might be going from Ethernet on the copper wire to ATM cells on the fiber optic wire, and it's going to have to fragment the IP frames that it's sending, which it can do. Like the routers can, can do all of that. The one thing I didn't mention, let me go back one more slide, so I forgot to mention security. So one of the things that's really interesting uh, about switches is that they do add a level of, of security by virtue of the fact that when two computers are talking, the virtual circuit that gets created is not visible by any of the other computers on that subnet. So when these guys are talking, I can't put eyes on, I guess that's an eyeball. No, that's not an eyeball. There's an eyeball. I can't watch the traffic on, on between those two. I don't see it. The switch doesn't let me see data that doesn't need to go to me. I'll see broadcasts, because broadcasts go to everybody. But I don't get to see those connections. Um, a good example of this was back in the days when we still used hubs. Hubs do just connect the network. Everybody sees everything. And so years ago, before we had switches everywhere, um, I. <laughs> made the mistake of turning on Wireshark during a, a live demo. And um, I, was, I was going through and, and we were watching somebody and it turned out that there was somebody in the room and um, we were able to see that this particular person had a fetish for Roman numeral 30. Because everything that they were doing while I was lecturing had, we, like, we looked at the website that, that they were going to, they all had number 30 in them for some reason. I, I'm not 100% sure what they're looking at. Um, and since it showed the host name and we could see that it was like MCT 164 station five, it wasn't hard to figure out who it was. Um, and so they were embarrassed to have exposed their numerical fetish. I was a little embarrassed because I kind of put it up on the screen and, and didn't like I didn't know ahead of time that that was going to happen. Um, so switches <laughs> would have prevented that. Um, but it is sometimes useful for application debugging to be able to turn on that super secret spy mode. And so 
network administrators can go into the switch configuration and they can put one port into promiscuous mode. And in promiscuous mode, it tells the switch fabric, I wanna see everything that's going to everybody. Uh, and so what that would allow you to do, for example, is to run Wireshark and see if anybody else happens to have a numbers fetish. Of course, because it's like a wiretap, the people that are, are doing that um, would have no idea that it's happening. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. So it, it, it can add security, but the security can easily be bypassed by a nosy systems administrator. Okay, um, see having done this lecture now like six times, I knew that I forgot to do that, which was a good, I, good thing I could go back and I could tell the story. Um, anyway, so, um, ugh. things to know when we go to create a subnet. So when we go to create a subnet, we need to know the number of subnets we wanna create because what's gonna happen in IP space is I need to create a network mask. I need to reserve part of every IP address to identify what subnet the device is on. And in order to pick the number of bits, I'm gonna to need to know that number of subnets. And whatever number of subnets I find, let's call that X, to find the number of bits that I'm gonna require, I need to take the log base two of X, but let's say x is five, that's not an even power of two, I need the next power of two that's gonna have that, and so we're gonna take the ceiling of that operation. So let's say, for instance, that we do the analysis and it turns out that I needed 11 subnets. If I take the log base two of that, it's gonna come out to be like three point something, 3.5 maybe, um, but when I take the ceiling, of the log base two. So first of all, log base two is like 3.5. I'm not sure what it really is. But when I take the ceiling of that, that's gonna be an integer and it's gonna be four. And to find out how many subnets I actually get, of course, I'm gonna use four bits. And I can just raise two to the four and I'm gonna have space for 16 subnets. So we really want to try to get to close to a power of two if we can. For instance, if um, I got to uh, nine subnets, well, I just missed the, the subnet or the power of two for eight and the next one's gonna be 16. So do I really want to waste that extra bit? Can I, could I think about rearranging the network to kind of get the number of subnets closer to a power of two? Maybe you can't, and if that's the case, then you're stuck. Um, so the formula for that is gonna be kind of familiar once we get done with this thing. Uh, the next thing I need is the number of hosts that I need on each subnet. And the reason why I need to know that is so that I can figure out how many bits that I need for the host address. So for instance, if I need three bits for the network number and I need five bits for the hosts, then if I take that IP version four address, some fraction of those is going to be assigned to me, but really the last five and then the next to last three are gonna be for me to allocate the subnet, which leaves 24 bits that are assigned by my ISP. So in other words, I need a class C address for all of this stuff, for all um, what would that be, 15 hosts? I'm sorry, this is two to the fifth, that's 32. This is uh, three, so this is eight, so 128 hosts. Okay, can't do math, there's a big difference between 15 and 128. Once we have this number of bits then, then we can go ahead and create the subnet mask. And so if I was doing this in CIDR notation, this is gonna be five plus whatever I get from my ISP. So if I got a slash 24 from my ISP, I'm gonna add the five onto it and say I have a slash nine. Um, and what this is kind of communicating, uh, no, sorry, I did that wrong. It's the slash, it's the three. Yeah, it's the three that I need to add. So the I got a, a slash 24 from my ISP, so I'm gonna advertise to the internal routers that I have a slash 27. And that's gonna let me have that, that three bits of subnet. 
Um, don't forget we can also move from that notation to the dotted quad net mask. So with 27 bits, I need to figure out 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then I have 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's what the subnet mask would look like with 27 bits. And so um, this is 255, this is 255, this is 255, and then this is not. So this is a 128 and a 64 and a 32. And if I add those together, that's a 14. And let's see, three, nine, that's a 12. And so this becomes a 224. So that would become the other way to express my network mask. And then once we have that, we can kind of derive everything else. I have two notes here. The first is don't forget to allow for growth. So if I find that I have exactly some power of two for my hosts or my subnets, don't pat yourself on the back and think job well done because it's likely that if you just miscounted by one machine, you're, you're screwed because you're not gonna be able to give it an IP address. That subnet would be full. If, or the likewise, if you forgot a network for some reason. So when you're making your plans as a good engineer, you should always allow for growth, maybe five or 10%. It all depends on what the past history was. Because if you allocate too much for growth, then when you, it comes time to um, buying a, a subnet from an ISP because you're going to pay per month for that ISP subnet or the router hardware to handle that capacity or the, the switches to handle that capacity. If you're really wrong, you're, you spent a lot of money that's just going to be wasted. And so one strategy you can do is kind of look at past performance. You know, if you see that this is time and this is like say the number of computers if your traffic is going up like you know like that maybe you probably don't need to allocate a lot of space for growth like you know you're just not growing that fast you know figure out what what the delta is here and and, and you know you can kind of go for it on the other hand, if you see a you know, nice straight line, okay, again, we can kind of plan for that kind of growth. Um, you know, we go back maybe three years, we see that it's a pretty constant slope. We can forecast how much space you're gonna need for the next three to five years, and then you tell your finance people, I need this amount of money to handle this amount of load. When you see graph that looks like this, run away, um, because <laughs> There's no way to predict what that's gonna do. I mean, it, was it you know, some quirk and you're gonna fall right off again? Or was it, you know, are you gonna keep on going for a while? Or you know, are you about to slow down? Um, I mean, that's just really hard to forecast. And so having to use this to figure out what capacity you're gonna need, um, you can be really, really way off. Probably the worst graph that you can see is you know when you start to see the decline in the number of, of computers or the number of users or whatever the thing is that starts to be a little bit of a concern because you know something that your company is shrinking and if you start to see this kind of a decline um, that's telling you that it's probably time to get your resume together like yeah that, that's that's not a good thing either run away from that exponential decline because because you're about to go bankrupt well maybe not you personally but uh, your company is and you could find yourself out of a job. Okay, so how does all this work? Well, let's say that we have a class C address and we've chosen a subnet mask of 25. Um, we want to be able to answer all of these different questions, but there's a piece of information that I didn't tell you. Can you think of what, what's missing? And if you guessed, that I didn't tell you the, the number of CIDR bits that I got from my ISP, good on you, you're right. But I did in a certain way. I said it's a class C address. So I called up Comcast or whoever I got my, my service from and they gave me this number, 192.168.10.0, but then they gave it to me as a 24. 
Or maybe they didn't. Maybe they gave it to me as a 25. Um, if they did, then we have a whole other set of issues to go through. But let's assume that they sold me a 24 and I'm carving it up um, into a 25. I could do that, right? Just because they gave me this address range, I get to choose to use it. Like the, the address range that I get from this number is a dot ten dot zero all the way to a dot ten dot two fifty five, right? Um, I get all eight bits. But when I use this this guy, what I'm saying is I'm gonna carve up this address space into some subnets. So let's first of all figure out what is that subnet mask? Well one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then one more. Um, is the binary version of that subnet mask. And of course, we could turn that into the dotted quad of 255.255.255. Mm, think about that. So this most significant bit represents 128, and that's the only one that's turned on. So this is my network mask. So that slash 25 or 255, 255, 255.128 are identical. Now, how many subnets can I have? Well, since this guy here is special, and the reason he's special is he can change, but these guys are, oh, can I get gray? There's no gray, darn it. Um, these guys are all fixed in stone. That's why I wanted to use gray. Those are fixed by my ISP. I can't change those, but I can change that bit. So I get one subnet for each of the possible values that that value can be. So I can have that value be a, <coughs> a zero or it can be a one. So that's, those are my two choices. And that makes sense. One bit, I get two choices, right? So I get two subnets. How many hosts can I have per subnet? So in this case, I have the remaining seven bits. How many do I get? I get two to the seventh. But I don't get to use all of those addresses. Remember, every time we have a subnet, we're gonna lose one for the net, uh, net number, and we're gonna lose another one for the broadcast number. So two to the seventh is 128, minus two is 126. So I get two subnets, each subnet with 126 hosts, which is, if you add that up, exactly not uh, the 256 that I got from my ISP. I lose four hosts in the process, but fine, it's all right. Um, so the next question is, what are the valid subnets, right? Well, the, the first subnet is going to be with this guy with a zero, and the rest of those are zeros. And then the second subnet is that guy with a one, and those being zeros. And so this becomes 192.168.10.0 and 192.168.10.128. Those are my two subnets. And those also correspond to the network addresses. So these are the network addresses for each of those two subnets. And they should, they, that should make sense, right? What are the broadcast addresses for each of those subnets? Well, it's gonna be the maximum number that I can have <clears throat> without going to the next subnet. So for this subnet, my broadcast address is 127. And for this subnet, my broadcast is 192.168.10.255. So again, we lose those two network numbers and broadcast numbers. So there, those are the two that we lose on each subnet. The last question is, what are the valid hosts 
that I can use to assign. Well, I get everything in between. So on this one, I get a dot one all the way to a dot 126. So obviously 192, 168, 10.1 through 192, 168, 10.126. It just gets repetitive to, to say the first stuff when it doesn't change. So we'll just abbreviate it to be dot one, dot 126. Likewise, over here, I get a dot 129 all the way up through a dot 254. And if you were to do the arithmetic, I do get 126 hosts on each subnet. This is a little bit more of a complex example, but it's also a much more real world scenario. <clears throat> so um, let's work through some of these issues. Um, we have some information that's given and our task is gonna be to figure out what kind of, of, of network layout do I need? And as a network engineer, this is gonna be um, one of those jobs that you're just gonna have to be able to do. So it's an important skill. The idea is that I have to have a server zone that has IP addresses for my servers and they're publicly facing IP addresses. So I'm gonna go to my service provider and I'm gonna contract with them to pay per month for some number of public facing IP addresses. Um, I have seven servers, but we're gonna find out that that's not gonna be enough. Remember we talked about that on uh, the next power of two problem. So let's think about the seven servers that I have, but then we say that we're gonna have to support NAT. Well, NAT also needs to have a public facing IP address. So in addition to the seven servers, I need to have a plus one for NAT. Um, so whatever my NAT server is gonna be, that's a plus, now I'm up to eight. And we say that we have to have a VPN zone and the way VPNs work is you have a public IP address that you connect to from the internet. And then once you connect to it, you get a local network um, that you can then route on the, the soft cushy side of your network. So um, you're kind of behind a firewall, you're on premises basically. But that IP address becomes a plus one. And the connection that I'm gonna have from my router to the ISP is another one of those connections. I don't have it written here because I said it was here. Um, we need one each for every WAN connection that we're gonna have connected. So that means we're gonna end up with a plus one for the router. And so now I have a total of 10 IP addresses that I need. Now, there's no room for, um, I don't have any growth factors into here, but that's okay because when I take the log base 10 or log base two of 10, I'm gonna find that that is uh, three point something. Um, and so when I take the ceiling of that, it's gonna say that I need four bits of subnet. So this I need to have, uh, um, from my ISP, I need to have 16 contiguous addresses. So I'm gonna go ahead, call up the, my ISP. I'm going to arrange for, um, a fraction of a class C, and they're gonna find some range of numbers that give me 16 contiguous. And so let's pretend that they assign to us um, 202.154.63. Um, and to make it um, a little less challenging, we're gonna start that off at zero. They could theoretically start it off just about anywhere. But we had to figure out now what the CIDR value should be. Well, that's all eight, that's all eight, and that's all eight. And I need to go all the way through that last value 
that are set by the ISP to leave four for me. And so I'm gonna end up splitting this. It's an 8-bit value, so if I need four for the subnet, that's gonna leave four that they get to pick. So my CIDR value is gonna be a slash 28. Now, what I want you to do is take a moment, hit pause. Well, not, not yet, don't hit pause yet. But take a moment and figure out what the net mask is in dotted quad. Um, you've seen me do it. Um, try to do it yourself. So turn this CIDR value into a net mask. Hit pause. I'll wait. You know, I have time because I'm on pause. Um, and then re hit resume when you think you have an answer. Seriously, hit pause. Okay, I'm hopeful that you've done that. If you didn't, your loss. So with the net mask here, we're gonna have all eights. And then in, in the most interesting one is this one. One, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four. So that's what the upper 28 bits are gonna look like. And in a net mask, that's gonna become 255, 255, 255, and then um, 128, a 64, a 32, and a 16. That's what those four bits are. 128, 64, 32, 16, no eight, no four, no two, no one. All right, so let's add these up. Um, that's a 12, 14, so that's a 20, that's 4, 10, 13, 14, 240. So my net mask should be 255.255.255.240. If you didn't get that, double check my work, because I may have messed up, let me know if I did. But I don't think so, it looks right. And it kind of vaguely sounds right from the previous six times I've done this video. <laughs> all right, hopefully I'm not going to have to do number seven or I'm going to lose my mind. Um, all right, so what this means is I'm going to have a server zone. And in that server zone, I get to have these 16 IP addresses. Uh, as we just saw, I need to pick my first. Oh, I need to know the broadcast address. And I need to know my net number, which we already kind of have. And then what's my first host? So host one all the way through host fifth. Well, we don't get host 15, right? I've lost two of those addresses. So I get host 13, sorry, 14. Okay, so my net number we just saw is gonna be 202.154.63.0. The broadcast address, that's going to be the, the all of these four bits here filled in. Oops, I didn't mean to erase those, I meant to do highlighter. So we're going to fill in those four bits. So that means my broadcast is 202.154.63.16. Fifteen. Sorry, it's going to be fifteen. Now, <clears throat> you're hopefully looking at this and catching what looks to be an error, right? Because the net mask was two forty, but I'm saying the broadcast is only fifteen, right? Well, just because those upper four bits are zero. Um, doesn't change the net mask. The net mask still says those are part of the network number. It just means that they're fixed. So I can't change them in any way, shape, or form. Um, it doesn't change my net, my, my net number or my broadcast number. It is still gonna be the lower four bits that I get to fill in for the broadcast number. Now I get to use everything in between for my hosts. So we could say, for instance, that the router gets to be dot one. That's kind of by convention. 
We could do, say, VPN is a dot two. We could do NAT is a dot 14, put it at the end of the whole list. And then everything else, the other hosts can fill in in between. All right, so now that we've done that, let's sketch out what this network is gonna look like. So I'm gonna have coming into my, uh, my facility. some kind of connection to the internet. And that was my attempt at drawing a cloud. It does not look like a cloud, I apologize. And what we're gonna say is this address here is assigned to us by the router. It's not our address. This is gonna be the link between us and our provider. We don't know what that address is just yet, but this router is going to go to a switch and that switch is going to have all of our servers and hosts connected to it and this segment this LAN segment is going to be this 202.154.63.0/28 that is this segment right here and the one thing I do know is that the router, this interface on the router is gonna be configured to have that IP address, 202.150, or sorry, yeah, 202.154.63.1. That is that router's IP address. And then I'm gonna tell all of these machines that your gateway, the address that you should use when you don't have any other way to go with the data is 202.154.63.1. That's going to be your default path to the rest of the world. So what's going to happen is when a server in this public space tries to send data to Google, um, it's not going to know how to go to Google, but it is going to know how to go to dot one. And then dot one is the router. The router says, I don't have any routes that route me directly to Google because I'm not Google but I do have a, a connection, a default connection to my ISP. So the ISP is gonna give you whatever IP address to fill in there, and then your router is gonna use that to send your request to Google to your internet service provider. So once all of that is working, that side of your network is done. It's golden, it's fantastic. The next thing that we're going to have to deal with is another network, which is where your PCs live. And remember that your PCs are all going to be using NAT, but they're also going to be using um, a local connection to a local network. And so I can make up whatever numbers I want here. Um, Let's say we're going to use the, the 10 number. So I'm going to say that this is a dot ten dot one dot um, one dot zero slash 24. So that's a fake local IP address net mask thing, but it's fine because essentially what I can do is just use it internally. The rest of the world doesn't need to know how to get to that. Um, this router is never going to see traffic for 10.1 coming from the internet. So it, it's just fine. It, it's just a placeholder for local use. Now the NAT functionality in the router is what's going to allow me to rewrite all of those addresses. But for now, we're gonna say that the router is 10.1.1.1. So again, if you're a PC connected out here, your IP address might be 10.1.1.24 but your, and your net mask is gonna be 255.255.255.0. Why? Because it's a slash, I said it's a slash 24. Even, so is it a problem that this net mask isn't the same? Nope, not a problem at all. The router is just gonna have different configuration rules. And what we're gonna do in the router's NAT configuration is when we're gonna have a rule that says um, whenever you see traffic coming from 202.154.63.14, rewrite it to go to 10.1.1.0. And if you see traffic from 10.1.1.whatever, 
rewrite it to use NAT and send it out over the public internet as if it was from 202.154.63.14. So your router is going to do that rule rewriting and then connect the dots. Um, we also said that we had some um, an intranet zone and the intranet zone is going to be things like print servers, file servers, things that you don't want to put out there for the whole world to use, theoretically. So again, we're just going to have another switch and we're going to have another LAN segment and this is where server is going to live and printer is going to live. And what we're going to need to do is to give it another network. It needs to be different from this one, so we'll call it 10.1.2.0. Wow. And we'll make it another 24. Okay. So at this point then, we'll make the router on this interface be 1. So the router is going to be 10.1.2.1 if you're in this domain. Um, and so let's say that this, this printer is 10.1.2.36. Its net mask is 255, 255, 255.0, and its default gateway, like when it needs to go to some other machine in your network, what address do I use for the router? It's going to be 10.1.2.1. Okay, one last thing is this VPN zone. And the VPN is going to be software that lives on one of these servers. And what we can do is have this VPN zone uh, route um, as, like, say, 10.1.4.0 slash 24. Um, and so we're actually going to have two subnets living over the same Ethernet link. That a problem? No, not at all. Uh, what will happen is when I go to configure the router, I'm going to tell it if you see traffic from 10.1.4.0, um, it does not get routed out over the public internet. Um, but it can talk to our servers, or it can talk to, say, your desktop PC for remote desktop, or whatever the rules are going to be. So, I know this was a lot. I don't want to sugarcoat that. This was a lot. But this is pretty complete. Like this is the layout for IP subnetting for a reasonably complex home office, or not a home office, but a, a small company, mid-sized company. Um, this is how you would figure out the IP addresses, the gateways, the network masks. You would want to kind of sketch something like this out on a piece of paper, write out the numbers, think about what the net masks are going to be, the gateways are going to be, keep them consistent so that you don't have to um, keep like typing in the wrong IP addresses for gateways and things. Um, but we should be able to build something like this in Packet Tracer, for example, and actually test it out and make sure that it works. Um, we'll see if we can get a lab that actually does this example later on, or maybe I'll do a demo. I haven't decided yet, even though I've done this thing six times. Still haven't decided. All right, um, what if I just need to have a subnet, a minimal subnet? Uh, what is the smallest useful uh, subnet number I can have? Um, in other words, what's the largest CIDR number I can have? Well. To allow two hosts to communicate, I need to have two IP addresses. And unfortunately, there are two strategies that we can follow. One is check to see if the operating system supports a point-to-point -point protocol, or P2P, depending on, on your operating system. Linux, for instance, does. So I can take two Linux machines, and I can get rid of the net mask and the broadcast address. And they can just do point-to-point. -point but you lose a lot of functionality that way. So we tend not to want to do that. So to allow two hosts to communicate, I also need to have the broadcast and I need to have the net number. So I really need to have four hosts. So how big, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think I have eight there. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in order to get me to uh, allow four hosts, I need to have these guys be f changeable, and that's why they're zeros. They're not fixed by the net mask. And that lets me have host zero, host one, host two, host three. Um, and so this CIDR address would be eight plus eight plus eight plus six is 30. Once you get beyond 30, uh, you don't really have a valid network mask anymore. Okay, so there's three examples. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. And you know, when we look at something as complex as this, it's not obvious how we could actually build out beyond this um, and, and kind of connect subnets in a really good industry standard way. So Cisco has three architectures for subnetting that we need to understand and, and think about the rationality why they're doing it. So the, the first version that we kind of did as an example was a pretty simple thing. It had lots of single points of failure, lots of bottlenecks, and, and we don't necessarily want to build that. So what Cisco has proposed are three different architectures for three different kinds of workloads. This first one is what they call the three-tier model. Um, there are three different groupings of devices. You have at the top a core switch, and we'll talk about this, these terms, some distribution routers, and then you go back to access switches. And the goal of this architecture is that you should never have any downtime. This is for very large organizations that need to uh, be able to support both their publicly facing business operations on the internet as well as their internal business operations and having a router crash and lose all of that revenue is not something that they're willing to to do so the core is going to be used as a switch to get traffic between partitions of the network as fast as possible and so you'll typically have multiple cores for very large organizations, or maybe just two cores for a smaller organization. I believe this is actually how they've done our data center. So I think there are a pair of core switches down in the, the, the data center. Um, I'm hoping to arrange a Zoom call where we can get the network administrator for campus to kind of zoom in and you guys can pepper him with some questions. Um, and hopefully he'll go with that. But we can find out if the, that's what the main campus architecture really is. The idea here is that these switches, and I'm talking about these right here, are literally blisteringly fast. They do not do any kind of routing. They don't do VLANs. They don't do packet filtering. They don't have work group access for like individual machines. These are just high speed distribution or high speed uh, switches with like 100 gigabit ports between them, multiple 100 gigabit ports between them. Like when I tried to draw the picture, I tried to show that like, like a super thick line, you know, these are, these are the, the backbone of your, your organization. They have to be highly reliable, so you're going to find, for instance, that they're going to be using multiple power supplies, they have multiple redundant processors, multiple redundant interfaces, they have uh, error correcting memory, they have, I mean, this, these things are, are built for enterprise use. Um, and you'll see on the next layer down that we still assume that they will fail, all right? so. Um, we had actually, I, I, I'm, like, I'm pretty confident we have this architecture and we had a core failure once. Um, it was really kind of surprising and uh, um, everybody was like, whoa. Anyway, um, so the core is gonna be used to just kind of link these different groups together. And 
The next layer down is this distribution layer, and these are going to be routers. And if we take a look at the, the distribution layer, um, again, I'm talking about this next layer down, so it's this grouping here. I want you to pay attention, first of all, to the outbound connections between the core and the distribution side. Each distribution router has two connections, one to each of the core switches. <coughs> And they're going to use those links for load balancing, but also for failover. So if one of the core switches went down, the distribution router will just route over to the other core switch. The, um, but at a cost, like they're just not going to be handling the same volume of traffic uh, with the same efficiency as those cores. So these are going to be routers, and these routers can do filtering, they can do VLANs, they can do firewalling, they can route to uh, an internet connection, they determine how packets enter the core and how they're scheduled on the core, um, they can do filtering and queuing, they have security, they do NAT, all of that stuff. So these distribution routers are doing kind of the heavy duty load, right? So why do we put all the load there and we have so many of them? Well, so that we can divide and conquer. I can have each of those routers handling a smaller fraction of the load as I just add more routers. So the idea is that um, as you start to use or hit utilization levels on these distribution routers that you just add more routers and you add more redundant connections to the core and to the switches below them. And let's take a look at the next layer down. This is the access layer. And at the access layer, we see these um, switches. On the left-hand side of this picture, we see just what would be normal user applications, PCs, with single connection to the switch. So like when I finally get back on campus, my computer has one connection to a switch. And if that switch fails, all 48 ports that are on that switch, or however many ports are on that switch, they go down, and, and there's nothing we can do about it. I'll lose my phone, I'll lose my printers, I'll whatever, I'll lose everything. Until, you know, someone comes along and reboots it. On the right-hand side, we see a slightly different organization where we see um, servers having redundant connections. So they'll have two network interfaces, each network interface going to two different switches. And then those switches go to two different distribution links. And the, again, the idea is that if I lost one of the access switches, the server just rolls over to the other interface. But in the meantime, the server could use both of those for performance. So if the web server is getting pegged, hopefully the email server is not, um, we can use some of the bandwidth that the email server would normally take um, to get to the other core or get to the other distribution router and eventually get to the, air, the, the internet. Um, even on the left-hand side, we could still have uh, some of those redundant connections, and the goal is really just to improve performance um, as opposed to redundancy. Um, on the right-hand side, though, we, we want that, that redundancy so that there's just no single point of failure for the things that are really critical. Why don't we do it for everything? Because it's expensive. In a data center, if I need to add new wires, I can literally just walk over and, and run new wire. Like it doesn't require calling somebody to do drywall work or an electrician to run the wires in the right place. In my office here at the university, if I wanted to have redundant network connections, I would literally need to have somebody come in and cable in new wires. That's very expensive to do. And if you did it for everybody on campus so that they could be wired into two different switches, not only are you now paying all that money for all the redundant connections, but now you're also paying for all those redundant switches and it just kind of escalates. And so the cost of me losing my PC for a couple of hours while somebody runs and a, te a technician grabs a spare switch and swaps them out. Um, okay, so it's inconvenient, but I'm not going to lose a ton of revenue. I could just get up and use somebody else's computer or I could just use my laptop in and use the wireless. You know, there's lots of other strategies. If our corporate web server goes down and this is how we make money, then I've got a big problem. And so I can't afford to have that go offline. And so then that drives the redundancy that I'm willing to pay for 
and the architecture. Um, all right, so I think we've talked about all of that. And so this gets us to um, what Cisco calls their collapsed core. It sounds like a neutron star, but um, I think maybe the marketing people missed an opportunity there. But the idea is we're gonna collapse the core and distribution switches and we're gonna aggregate them into um, these kind of special purpose-built routers that have the switch functionality uh, built, the fabric for that built right into them. And so really what we're looking at here are for much smaller organizations um, where I don't need that um, super high speed. I don't have a ton of multiple distribution routers. I mean, and, and in fact, now that I think about it, this might actually be closer to where we are on campus, even though we have like thousands of computers. Um, the cost is significantly lower. And what we're taking advantage of here is the constant improvement in the switching hardware and in just the processing power that we can put into these devices uh, according to Moore's law. You know, the, the uh, capability of these things just gets better and better and better. The core, an aggregated core like this from now, it probably has the same horsepower as something like this from you know even five to ten years ago and you know these are probably at the time like million dollar core switches you know now you might only be looking at half a million dollars each for uh, these combined distribution systems um, the big disadvantage is it's just not going to scale beyond where we see it here so we are going to be limited to the capacity and to the core's ability to handle huge amounts of traffic. Um, and so, you know, you, you get what you pay for, um, but sometimes you don't need the millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff. And then there's one final variant that Cisco has come up with, and this is what they call spine and leaf. And again, we're gonna see the same aggregated core and, uh, well, core and aggregated router all together um, and these are going to comprise these links here that go to these special switches comprise the spines. These are very high bandwidth, very short distance because this is built for a data center. So this is built to stay in the server room, not to go across campus. And the idea is that these might be very short 10, 40 or 100 gigabit lines and we're going to put multiples in to each of these aggregated routers. And these are special purpose-built switches. Uh, Cisco sells them as Nexus switches versus the general, you know, the, the stuff that, you know, poor people buy or the catalyst. <laughs> um, you know, they're a few thousand dollars. I'm not, I don't even know what these Nexus switches cost, but they're designed to be what are called top of rack switches or TORs. And these top of rack switches are very high bandwidth. We're going to have multiple connections from multiple servers going into each of these tours. So the way it's kind of shown here is like this server is going to have a connection to that tour and to that tour. And it may even have multiples into each one. And then the tours have multiple connections to um, uplinks to each of the different aggregate servers or aggregators and uh, more redundancy. Why do we do these special things? Because each of the switches is going to have exactly the same latency um, and as soon as there's a problem we can immediately reroute traffic across these redundant links. And the goal is to be able to have a failure and not lose any data. Um, actually, the goal is not to have a failure in the first place, but if you have to have one, you want to make sure that it is handled as well as possible. So this is the spine. And then these server connections here are the leaves. All right, so you, you as a network, you're a network engineer, you have come up with a whole plan for subnetting, you have typed it all into all the different routers and switches and PCs, and nothing works. Um, or it was working yesterday, but it didn't work in today. Uh, how do you begin to troubleshoot this stuff? 
Um, there's three commands I want to roll through. The first one is, and then we're almost done, I promise. This has been a long lecture seven times over, um, but we're almost done. So ping is used for um, sending control messages and getting replies back from remote machines. Um, it uses a protocol called the Internet Control Message Protocol, uh, which we'll see in the next chapter again. But the idea is I can ping my local machine, and if that fails, then I have a local software configuration. Nothing's going to work. If I ping my local IP address that's connected to an interface, if that fails, then the network device driver is broken. The, the, there's just some borkage somewhere. Maybe I don't have the network interface configured with the IP address I think it is. Maybe it's got the wrong IP address. That's why nothing's working. So that's just like a sanity check. If, if those two things don't work, step one and step two, then your configuration's insane, fix that. Step three is you try to ping the local side of the LAN gateway. So let me jump back a couple slides to here. If I was sitting in this PC, I would wanna ping this router interface. So I would ping 10.1.1.1 and if that works, that tells me that everything from here to there is fine. If that doesn't work, then I've got some more work to do because it could be a dead switch or it could be that the router is misconfigured um, or I'm using the wrong IP address. But if that works, that tells me that I'm getting to the right place. So pinging your local side of a router interface is a really good strategy for what's broke. Um, then you ping the remote server. And if that remote server fails, then probably I've gotten through the local router and now my WAN connection's busted or something's busted in between. So for instance, if I can't get to Google, but I can get to Microsoft or vice versa, then it tells me my WAN connection's fine. It's just that somewhere the, the best effort routing has failed and it's probably nothing I can do about it. So this simple strategy of, of kind of going down through a troubleshooting tree of how can I figure out what part of my network is working and what part of my network isn't working um, is a really, really useful strategy. Um, one other command uh, is this thing called traceroute. If you haven't used it before, um, it's a lot of, it, it's actually really interesting. So traceroute tries to passively guess the route that your traffic has been following. Now, from one instant to another instant, these routes can change just because as you go through um, the network interchanges, um, it might be picked up by different interchanges. But the idea is you can do this trace route command. I did this from campus to um, one of Google's machines, and we can see that we kind of go from the CS, uh, the School of Engineering to some internal network to the campus WAN connection out the campus, couple hops, and then suddenly we're at Google and in Washington, D.C. And then once we're on Google's network, we make a couple more hops and suddenly we're in California. Um, and so sometimes you can actually see, they'll, they'll give them names and those names will actually give you the geolocation of where these things are and you can actually see on a map um, where your traffic is. But what's really interesting is it shows you the times as well. So as I look over here, I can see how much latency is being added to each of my, uh, along each of these hops. So my switch, getting from sloop to the switch is um, 0.4 milliseconds. Getting through and off campus is 10 milliseconds. So that's actually a fair amount of delay um, just to get to the internet. But then to get down to Washington DC is only 24 milliseconds. And so it looks like the bulk of the delay is getting through campus and then getting through um, to Washington DC. Google seems to be quite fast, not a surprise. Anyway, if you run trace route different times of the day, different machines, you can see all kinds of different traces. And if you get some borkage somewhere, in other words, something's broke, uh, you'll be able to just see a bunch of stars um, and then you won't get any further. Th that's different than getting a bunch of stars and then continuing on. Those are just machines that refuse to, to advertise to a trace route request. Um, but the fact that I keep on going means everything is good. Oh, look at that. 
And if you see a star in the time, it meant that we dropped the packet. So uh, this, remember we talked about packet loss. They're a router um, somewhere between us and Google. Um, it doesn't mean that it was Google that dropped that packet. It just means it was dropped somewhere along the way. Um, but when you start to see high packet loss or big times, um, it can tell you that the problem is not local. And so when your boss is screaming at you, why is the website down? You can show them this and say, it's not my fault, man. Really not my fault, don't fire me. Um, I can't fix it, but the good news is neither can anybody else that you can hire. Finally, the last command, and I promise this is, this is just about it, um, is this thing called ARP. ARP is used for the address resolution protocol. We'll look at that again when we see layer two, but sometimes your IP is configured correctly, but there's a problem at the layer two level and this is really going to be affecting your local machine. So getting from one local machine to another local machine, that communication is going to happen over Ethernet. So we're going to take some application data. So we're going to take a web message and then we're going to put that into a TCP and then we're going to stick it into an IP frame and then we're going to put it into an Ethernet frame and it goes out over the wire. If this Ethernet frame can't find your local IP recipient, then even though this is right and this is right and this is right, you still don't go anywhere. So the way that you can figure out, can I see the remote side, is ask the operating system to tell you. Because um, it's going to keep a map of what IP addresses and what uh, Ethernet hardware device IDs it's seen. And so, for example, um, somebody on Sloop apparently tried to go to compienggr.ship.edu at some point in the recent time. And when they did, Sloop literally sent a message, a broadcast that said, anybody know the Ethernet address for 157.160.36.48? And most likely, Comp B responded with, yeah, I do. It, I'm at... 0, 0, 50, 56, 89, 76, 9 f And Sloop's like, fantastic. Now I know what to do with this IP packet. I'll put it on the wire with an Ethernet frame that says it's from me to you. Have a nice day. If that doesn't work, you're not going to get to talk to your local network. So for example, um, somebody on Sloop tried to go to uh, 158 SO5, so station 5 and MCT 158. And the station 5 and 1 must not be turned on or is having a network problem, but we know the IP address, we just don't know the name or the, uh, the hardware device ID. And even if the machine was on and we don't have that information, there's no talkie talkie. Um, and so at this point, that machine is effectively disconnected from Sloop. Um, if it is up and everything else is working, then I would want to go and start debugging that interaction. Use Wireshark and see if we can see the ARP messages go back and forth. Maybe there's some confusing ARP messages, or maybe somebody's lying and saying, yeah, I have it, it's, it's some other random address. <sighs> we did it. Less than one hour and 30 minutes. I think every time I do these, um, the time gets shorter and shorter. So um, anyway, so that is the end of chapter four. I am hopeful that this is the last time I'm going to do this video. Um, I will see you again in the next chapter, or I will see you again <laughs> one more time um, in this, uh, this series.